Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Luke 16, verses 14 and 17. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus is making a point with his parable about the rich man and Lazarus. The same point he makes in every parable, actually. You cannot hear a single thing that I'm saying. After he says this in the parable, he flips this one so that it is really shocking to his hearers, to you, his people. The parable starts out the way that everyone expects. There's a difference, of course, between the rich and the poor, between the good and the bad, the right and the wrong. Now, everything looks like it's going to go right over the middle of the plate. And then all of a sudden, as the parables do, it twists. It's not a fastball, it's a changeup. Jesus starts talking about this strange business about a man in hell who's crying out for help, and Abraham won't give it to him. Now, the worst thing you can get is to get all the way to Jesus, all the way to Jesus, and then have him tell you a parable. It's awful. You get all the way to Jesus, you make your way to him, and then he tells you a parable, and he's telling you a parable that's a third-person story about those guys over there in heaven and in hell. And what happens when you hear Jesus tell a parable about third persons who are over there? You're sitting here processing what he's saying. And what do you want, or what do you do when you hear a parable, especially from the mouth of Jesus? What does it really have to do with you? All right, so there's the rich man, and there was the poor man. But what then do you do? Maybe you ask, which one am I? That's how it usually goes. And then you try to do what the fancy theologians today call placing yourself into the story. Well, nothing could be worse, actually. You're sitting there trying to place yourself, and you're trying to figure out, am I the rich man or the poor man? Am I the good or the bad? Am I on the right or the wrong side of this parable? I don't exactly have sores that the dogs are licking on. That doesn't sound too good for me. On the other hand, I'm not exactly as terrible as that rich man. So where do I fit? And what does Jesus tell you about this question? Where do I fit, Jesus? About that, he doesn't actually say a thing. So then you just sit there trying to work it out. What's the key point? How do I fit into this situation? And as I said before, that's really the worst possible situation you can put yourself in. You could possibly be in. To get all the way to Jesus and then to have him not tell you by speaking a parable. That seeing you would not see and hearing you would not hear. So now you have to figure out exactly what this sort of thing is going to, how how this sort of thing is going to end because parables from Jesus' lips are always very interesting but they're not the gospel, at least not in and of themselves. And then everything turns when a father is mentioned. Coincidental for today, Father Abraham is mentioned. And what he's saying is really awful too. When you get to Jesus, you don't want a parable. And when you get to Father Abraham, you don't want him talking about a great chasm. You don't want him saying to you, well, I'm sorry, there's a huge ditch between me and you, and there is no bridge. There's no way to cross over from hell to heaven, and all of this is decided, over and done. There's nothing more to be said. That's a terrible situation to be in. 
That's why I read you the context, just going back a few verses before the parable. You have to remember that in Jesus' day, there was a great fight going on. The fight was about who's the hero of the Bible. Who's the big kahuna in the Bible? Who's number one in the Bible? And for Jesus' hearers, there's two forerunners, two frontrunners, either Moses or Abraham. Moses or Abraham. And that big fight is finally about whether the Bible, the Old Testament as we call it, was finally about Moses or whether it was finally about Abraham. But there was even a fight about why Abraham was so great. What makes Abraham the father of us all? Which is what this parable is all about. So that it is into his bosom you will be taken in heaven. Not Moses' bosom, but into Abraham's bosom. And that's where heaven actually is. The question isn't so much about who your earthly father is, who you are a son of by birth, but rather who your spiritual father is. Is it the teaching of Moses? Is it the catechesis of Abraham? And that's why Abraham is brought into the story. Not Moses and the law, but Abraham and the promise that is the key thing. The promise we heard in Genesis 15, our Old Testament text. Because between Moses and the law and Abraham and the promise, there is a great chasm that cannot be crossed. In the parable, heaven is actually where Abraham and the promise are. And hell is where Moses and the law are. So then, the agony of hell is to have no promise on which your life is based, but only to have the law, thou shalt and thou shalt not, and its record of your works, where you have done right and where you have done wrong. And that's all you've got to be in order to be in hell, a record of your works. However you put it before the Lord, it's never enough, and you're not going to receive a reward. But you don't have to wait until you die to find out whether you are in heaven and hell. (laughs) You're already in one or the other right now. Most people divide heaven and hell regarding the matter of works. Have I done enough or have I not done enough? And then I try to figure out where I fit on that continuum, that line. The difference between being in heaven or hell right now is the difference between having only the law or having God's promise preached to you. That twist in the parable, that thing that sets us on edge, that makes us uncomfortable, is that the dividing line between heaven and hell isn't between being rich or poor, being good or bad, between being right or wrong at all. The dividing line between heaven and hell in Jesus' parable is a preacher who comes and tells you exactly where you fit into the parable where you are located, in heaven or in hell. Is your father Abraham or is your father Moses? So I come to you again today as your preacher to say to you in Jesus' words, not only is there a great chasm between heaven and hell, a dividing line between good and evil, but there is also a dividing line between Abraham and Moses. And that line is between the promise and the law. I'm here to say to you that Jesus' words are for you that when you depend upon yourself, on your own works, you're already in hell. You've set yourself apart from God. Living by the law, you are doomed. But the same word that was spoken to Abraham, I now speak to you. You are forgiven and loved for Christ's sake. You are your heavenly Father's child even now. Already, now, as children of the promise, those who listen to their father Abraham, you're already in heaven. There's no way to make your way across the chasm between heaven and hell by yourself. There is no bridge, and you cannot make that step. It's not under your control. So how great it is then (laughs) that you have a preacher who applies Jesus' words to you, 
so that from this day forward, every time you hear that word of forgiveness, the promise spoken, you are once again brought into the bosom of Abraham. You're like John in the picture of the Last Supper, leaning on Jesus' breast. Not because of what you've done, but because Christ has done it for you and gives it to you by way of the promise. There is a great chasm between you and sin, death and Satan, and it will never be crossed again. So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.